put out two two thoughts uh, pertaining to practicing and pertaining to getting ready for that. As always, feel free to drop in your questions in the chat or in the comments. I'll, I'll see them as we go. But um, I want to talk about two things having to do with um, being your preparedness and accountability and that nobody is going to hold you more accountable than you. And uh, something I've been noticing for my students is that the, the bar is too low that they're that uh, you're holding for yourself. You know, every time you come into a lesson or have materials that are prepared for a lesson, I think you should be at a performance level. Uh, the excuse of, oh, I didn't have enough time is always going to be an excuse. And I don't find it to be uh, super valid because everyone's busy and it just has to do with your priorities. So as you're getting ready for school, getting ready for doubling down on some of the hard work that's going to come with getting back uh, with the fall semester, the end of summer, I just want you to keep that in mind. You are the only person that's going to hold you accountable to your goals and the progress that you want to make during the semester. So uh, make sure that you're holding yourself accountable. Record yourself. See if it's really up to, to par. You know, there's so many easy ways to check what you're doing. Uh, and that leads me to my second point that I want to make is that if you are a jazz musician, want, or if you're in a jazz program and you are studying that music or you're in any program studying any music, I highly recommend that you listen to that music. I highly recommend that when a teacher uh, is talking to you about, uh, hey, Alton, I see you there. Good luck at starting your, he's got a new gig that's about to start. Uh, good luck with that. I highly recommend if your teacher assigns you something say to learn a tune for example that you at least listen to that tune one time and have some context for what that tune is and what the, how the song goes and uh, i can't tell you how many times that it's happened where somebody gets a real book and starts playing something and it just totally defeats the whole purpose of what we're doing here we're trying to internalize this music we're trying to uh, get on the same page as our heroes you know we're trying to learn it we're trying to master it as best we can and a huge part more than 50 percent of your musical identity your musical progress is going to come from listening and absorbing and thinking and talking just as much as putting the time in on the horn putting the time in uh where one whatever you're uh, practicing whether it be piano drums trombone doesn't really matter a super lot uh, i just i find I find it amazing, actually, how many people will come in and they've never listened to a song and they want to try to play it. It's like, how, are you, how do you have any context for that? It's like opening up a book of a different language or just reading out loud without having any uh, context for maybe what it's for or how it goes. So please, as you're getting ready for school, let me just re reiterate those two points as people are dropping in questions. Um, thanks for dropping in if you're just joining us. Uh, we're talking about jazz and music and trombone. And um, so those two points were one, the only person that's going to hold you accountable to your, you know, musical development is yourself, right? So you have to make sure that you're holding yourself accountable. Don't come into your lesson unprepared because I, I could care less. I mean, I want you to be as good as you can. It doesn't matter to me if you come in and it's not as good as it could be, but it should matter to you. We're going to work on things no matter if you practice for one hour or 20 hours on something. There will always be something to improve on. And it's the same for me if I bring in something. There's always going to be things to improve on. So I, I just hold yourself accountable to be the do the best you can when you bring something in. Don't bring it in uh, half-assed, as they would say. So just think about that, You know, holding yourself to that high level. Whatever, whoever your heroes are, you know, hold yourself to that bar, whether they're alive or passed on, you know, and uh, just keep that in mind. And number two, listen to the music that you're trying to uh, learn. If you're doing good. I'm looking to purchase a microphone and stuff to start recording. Could you recommend some good quality mics that are good for recording trombone? I like um, ribbon mics personally. I like the Coles 48, 4038. That's going to cost you over two grand, though. Um, so it's a little bit... Uh, a little bit too much. A little bit too much probably for a home recording setup. Um, I use this microphone that's sitting right in front of me. It's pretty pretty simple, pretty affordable. It's from Apogee. Uh, it's just called a mic. It's just a USB mic. Some people will argue that it's you know not the best or whatever, but I think it sounds pretty good. And if you learn to EQ it, it can sound pretty good. Um, you can really use a whole wide range of things, especially if you get 
into the plugins and figuring out how to use compression and equalization, uh, you can make the trombone sound like a trombone. So uh, I recommend that. And, you know, but there's a Cascade Fathead microphone that sounds nice. Uh, you can check that out. I, I just like ribbons. AEA is a company that makes nice microphones about half the price of the Coles. But um, it's, still, it's still kind of a lot to get started with. But uh, you can check out um, the Apogee ones are pretty affordable. And uh, yeah, so I hope that gets you started in the right direction, Vito. There's so many microphones out there. You can, there's Royers. I, I personally just, I like the sound of ribbons, but they're more expensive. So that's where I would send you. It's on my list of things to buy. Uh, I haven't gotten to it yet, but that, that's where I would go. Uh, so DJ is asking for new tunes, uh, new recordings to check out. I saw he posted on uh, Facebook looking for new recordings to check out. Um, I've been kind of digging into um, some tunes, getting stuff ready for the semester, thinking about, I've been, I went back to kind of really dig into Cone Alma uh, and listen to Dizzy Gillespie playing Cone Alma and just some different ways people play that tune, Cone Alma. Um, that might be something you haven't thought about in a while, DJ. I know we never talked about that tune. Uh, what are other things I've been listening to? I've been kind of staying up on the Spotify state of jazz and Jazz Express and some of the new releases uh, that are coming out. I try to stay on top of what's happening and see how maybe, you know, we can make music with our label outside the music that kind of reflects what's happening now. I like to try to stay on top of those kind of things. So that's kind of what I'm checking out. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing really new or different. There's a bunch of tunes that I've been wanting to learn that I'm trying to get back to. So I've been thinking about In Your Own Sweet Way, the uh, great Dave Brubeck tune. I've been thinking about, um, some different bebop heads uh, and some different uh, just, just things to get back to. I've been trying to shed my own my own stuff. Like I put out all these books and sometimes uh, I practice it when I create it and then I put it away for six, eight, ten months and then come back to it. So I've been practicing this book actually to kind of record some of them, this Get Set book. It's a bunch of etudes uh, using kind of like a Bach approach, kind of trying to outline harmony and kind of a horizontal way, you know, kind of like a Bach cello suite, but kind of with jazz harmonies. So that's what I've been kind of shedding. Uh, I know that doesn't really answer your question, DJ, but that, I've been, I like that new um, Joshua Redman, Christian McBride, Brad Meldow, Brian Blade record. That's a really nice record. Uh, you can check that out. Um, I don't know. I got to get back into it. Any thoughts about trying tunes more towards smooth jazz, e.g. Brian Culbertson? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's not really my thing, so I probably won't do it. But um, nothing wrong with it. I mean, everybody has their own vibe. I'm kind of too obsessed with uh, chromatic harmony and mixed modes and so that all of that kind of nerdy jazz stuff, unfortunately. I mean, that's just kind of like where my interest lies. So I'm going to kind of keep going with that uh, and probably won't necessarily get too much into that, that vein. Although I have seen some people talk about how this kind of new lo-fi, chill, kind of like the thing I released today is kind of like the modern version of s smooth jazz. So maybe maybe it's that. Uh, I don't know. I'm open to exploring, though. So I'm always open to new opportunities. So if anybody out there wants to uh, work on something, let's let's talk. Ten thoughts on bebop and how it relates to present day music. Loaded question. Yeah, that's definitely... Um, a loaded question but anthony asks would you ever collaborate with christian mcbride one day uh of course i would yeah i have subbed in his big band a couple of times in new york but uh hopefully one day they'll call me for a gig but uh, that trombone section is pretty great with michael d steve davis uh james burton the third and doug provience so i wouldn't uh, trade that and i think alton is subbed in the band too so uh me and alton are going to duke it out i'm kidding uh so yes of course i would but um Rela uh, relationship to present day music and bebop. So I think, you know, bebop developed out of musicians' frustration in swing. Uh, Michael Deese, not Michael Davis, uh, Anthony. Michael Deese, D-E-A-S-E. -E. Michael Davis is also great, don't get me wrong. And I'm on his big band record, which is great. It's called Hip Bone Big Band, that's killing. Uh, but uh, so back, to, back to Alton's question about um, bebop and modern music. Uh, what I was going to say is that it was always kind of like an underground musician's music. And I think that there's still um, that same relationship now to like a different type of stuff like um, like Marquise Hill or somebody like that. That's like really blending those <clears throat> those vocabularies together, like kind of like the more hip hop aesthetic and like the music, the musicians aesthetic, along with the popular aesthetic, you know, taking what 
they took the swing and blended it with that more chromatic relationship to the harmony and so people are kind of doing the same thing in a different way now so i think it's like still like kind of a, of a musician's approach to popular music which is what jazz really is so i kind of think it's i kind of think it's really the same i suppose um but i mean it's hard to really like fuse the two together in terms of the actual language because you start playing but do da uh, over the top of like a one chord vamp or something, a modal vamp, it's going to sound a little bit out of character. So uh, I, to me, the most important thing, and I've said this before on other live streams, is, you know, ask yourself the question, what does the music need right now? And that means it'll tell you what vocabulary bag or bucket you should kind of think about or be inspired by. So, um, you know, try and contextually play the music as as it kind of comes to you in relationship to that question what does the music need uh right now what's your take on why there hasn't been any innovators in jazz as big as dizzy bird miles train etc oh i think that's an extremely subjective question um i would say that that has to do with uh, you're living in an era and we're looking back at history and um you could you could say that a lot of people are being innovative but uh, people are kind of taking jazz and and breaking it apart into the, all these kind of sub little genres i think so uh there's no monster personality so i think that one reason that those people are defined as like innovators right um is not only because of their amazing musicians but they also had big personalities they became uh cult follow there was cult followings for all of them right like monk had his thing and train had his thing and bird and miles and dizzy of course right so I think that we've come to a point where, you know, I think that uh, there's there's plenty of innovators. We just we can't give historical innovation status in the present, really. You know, you can only assess what's happening now. Like people, of course, knew they were great at the time, but there was no way that they would have maybe necessarily known that they were going to be great right at the beginning. Right. So you can't uh, you can't assess the present as the past, you know, like you're always looking in hindsight at the past and don't have the don't have the context of the of the present so i think there are people we just don't know who they are yet uh and i think there are trombonist innovators i i see your other question here abel uh how do i get that back to it he says trombonist innovators and i think there are i think michael deese is one of those people taking the taking the technique of the instrument to the next level i think elliot mason is one of those people uh again pushing the technical boundaries of the of the harmonic approach of the instrument, developing a very unique and high level approach. Um, I think there's people like Corey King doing stuff in that more kind of hip hop vibe. There's people like Corey Wilcox who are also kind of coming out of the Wycliffe Gordon, Ron Westray uh, aesthetic. Wycliffe Gordon is another one of those people who is a, definitely an innovator who's bringing like that soulful vibe and like blues drenched vocabulary to highly technical, things and like very trombonistic things things you can't do on other instruments really embracing the vocal vocal nature of the trombone so i think there are innovators and i think that to say that there aren't is um just missing the context right in 20 years we'll be able to look back and say like yeah uh they were innovators in our time but we just didn't, couldn't recognize it or it wasn't time to recognize them as that just yet in my opinion, that's my, just my opinion. One man, one guy's opinion that plays trombone is that someone like Wycliffe Gordon and Steve Ture and Steve Davis and these guys that are playing with everyone, they are going to be the J.J. Johnson, Curtis Fuller, Slide Hamptons. But in 20, 30, 40 years, we just can't create that context right now. So I think there's lots of innovators and uh, whoops. And yeah, and bass trombonists, too. I mean, there's some young players that are tearing it up. Like if you guys don't know Reggie Chapman. Uh, Reginald Chapman, sorry, and then the the other, and then uh, also Chris Glassman, who um, won our UNT Jazz Trombone competition last year. Which, by the way, we are having again this year. So be on the lookout for information coming in the next couple of weeks about that, and that'll be open to 30 and under uh, <clears throat> trombonists, 30 and under, bass or tenor, doesn't matter, enrolled in school or not, doesn't matter. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that more another day. Uh, let's see. 
So my only opinion that we should have more jazz artists in the music industry. Yeah, well, Anthony, I think there are lots of jazz artists in the music industry. Uh, we're just all kind of in our little jazz corner, and a lot of us have to push a little harder to get out of our little corner into the mainstream, whatever that means. So, you know, we push one person at a time. We've been talking about that all week in our music marketing uh, masterclass about how to kind of break out of your little niche. Uh, we do have, trust me, Anthony, there are tons of new jazz artists that come out every single week. If you look at all the new releases, uh, I'm not trying to be argumentative with you or anything. I'm just trying to say that they are out there. And it's like if we just open our eyes a little bit and go take a look for them, they, they, they're all out there. Uh, what, let's see, some great trombonists, for example, that just put out records. They put out records with me, so I'm a little biased but uh, with my label. But Javier Nero, a great uh, he, we worked at Juilliard together, and he and I uh, know each other from there, but he did his doctorate at Miami, and then he put out this record. It's called Freedom. And then there's a trombonist who I met way back in 2010 in the ITF uh, Carl Fontana competition. We were both finalists uh, in 2010 in Austin, Texas, actually, and that's uh, Brian Scarborough. He put out a record called uh, Sunflower Song, and that came out uh, a couple of days ago, oh, last week, last Friday, a week ago today. And then... Um, so there's a couple of new trombonists that have just come out. So trust me, as a person that gets more music in my inbox than I can possibly release, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, new music coming all the time. So just try to keep your eyes open, watch those Spotify and Apple Music new new jazz playlists, and you'll find tons of new inspiring stuff. I promise you. What are the pros and cons of being a part of a label? Uh, that's mm, let's see if I can answer this quickly. Uh, the pros. The reason to do it, especially as a young artist, is for access, basically. Uh, access to a community, access to a distributor, access to playlist curators, access to expertise, access to uh, any number of things that, you know, are only available to people that have already done this before basically there's like there's a lot of like little details that can get overlooked not saying that you can't release music very easily on your own because you can uh, but getting on a label a small indie label especially like ours that's super artist focused really want to bring to life the project uh, of each artist and not too much worry about like what we think we should they should look like or sound like you know we have our uh, aesthetic but that being said it's pretty open to wanting to achieve whatever the artist wants to achieve so uh, the, the, the the pros are that community those access to resources that expertise uh, access to distributors access to maybe discounts or uh, other team members you know we have deep vendors that we work with that we have agreements with that are going to be maybe a different or better rate than you're going to be able to get on your own because we're bu we're buying 10 to 12 campaigns as opposed to you just buying one uh, the negatives are you know you're not totally in control because it's a little bit of collaboration uh, some labels take take your publishing and your copyrights and stuff like that you have to be really careful there's one deal i signed where they took um I th between 80 and 90 percent and uh I felt really not great about that. So I decided um, to keep that as a focus of our labels to make sure that our artists are predominantly taking home as much money as we can have them uh, take with still covering our expenses. And uh, yeah, uh, what should I send you? How early should I send it? Uh, if, the, if you're interested in sending in music to the label, uh, the timeline, you know, right now we're looking at February 2021 for new anything that comes in. Uh, we need four months ahead of time of having a disc in hand. So that means uh, back a couple months, you got to have your finished master and your artwork. Back a couple months, you got to be mixing. Back a, back a couple months, and you got to um, be doing the recording. So eight to 10 months out, you should be recording, you know, and then we need at least four months from having physical discs in hand. So you got to keep in mind. And why do we have to do that? Is because of. Uh, long lead press. Long lead press is magazines mostly, and that's things like Downbeat and Jazz Is. If you don't care about those things, we can move faster, and that's what I tell artists all the time. If you don't care about getting in those magazines, sure, we can release it next week. However, you're going to not be able to get on any playlists. You're not going to get any press if you just do a surprise release uh, that way. So think ahead. Uh, look, We're looking at February 2021. If somebody were to send me something today, send us something today. So thanks for being here today and uh, we will see you next week back every Friday at this time that's 1 p.m. Eastern so we will catch you then thanks again